last year and um, was just uh, enchanted. So um, I always start with a disclosure slide. Uh, when I give this talk in particular, um, <laughs> I serve on the Duke University Institutional Review Board and I'll talk about what an IRB is. Um, but I certainly do not presume to speak for them. Um, and uh, in many ways, what I will talk about is sort of my uh, attempts um, in fits and starts to um, bring about change from within. Um, so I love this quote from Ralph Ellison uh, from The Invisible Man, and this is just the, the first part of it. Um, I am a man of substance, of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids, and I might even be said to possess a mind. Um, so just a beautiful sentence, I think, and a beautiful assertion of, of what it is to be a human being. Um, the puzzle I want to get at is what does it mean to be a research participant? What does it mean to be um, in this country involved in the research enterprise. Um, we can't all be scientists, even those of us who are scientists or like me who are recovering scientists, um, uh, find a hard time getting uh, external funding to do our work. Um, so, you know, the, the pie in real terms has shrunk, um, but the importance of research, I, I readily admit is, is undeniable, um, and uh, if you don't believe it, my colleagues have written many papers to tell you why you should be a research participant. Um, and this is something I like to discuss with my students, you know, have you pulled a, a flyer off the wall and, you know, gone down to the psychology lab and gotten 20 bucks to take a survey or do puzzles or, or whatever. Um, it is important, it has made a difference, it continues to make a difference. Uh, I'm interested in genetics just by virtue of my training and, and my long-standing interest in heredity. Um, so, you know, uh, children with cystic fibrosis used to die in their teens, uh, now they live into their 40s. Uh, people with Down syndrome, same, they live into their 50s and 60s. And much of that can be attributed to uh, biomedical research. So uh, I mentioned at the beginning um, that I'm a member of an IRB. Um, the IRB is to some extent shrouded in mystery. Uh, we meet um, in a windowless room, typically. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let you in on that in a second. <laughs> um, and what we're supposed to do is to assess all of the research that is going on at our institution um, and make sure it's being conducted ethically. And as it says here, uh, we want to protect the rights and welfare of human research subjects. Um, so right away, just even reading this definition, I bristle a little bit. Um, I don't like the word subjects. Uh, I always feel that if I'm a research subject, then the principal investigator doing the study must be some sort of royalty. Um, so I prefer the word participant. Um, but anyway, this is what we are tasked to do. Uh, at Duke, we review uh, well over a thousand protocols a year. We have eight separate IRBs that meet each month to discuss you know, what are the scientists proposing to do in this particular study? And is it being done in a way that um, is respectful of and uh, protects the welfare of the participants? This is actually what goes on. Um, uh, I'm the guy in the back there looking at his watch. Um, this is obviously from uh, 12 Angry Men, um, wonderful film with Henry Fonda. Uh, we're usually more than 12. Um, 
we're probably 50-50 gender-wise, um, and I don't think really any of us are angry, with the possible exception of me. <laughs> um, and we do our best. We go through these things. These meetings last a long time. And uh, we try to honor the regulations as they are written and um, to uh, adjudicate things as best we can. Um, so as part of my role on the IRB, I get a protocol each month. And I go through it, and I have a checklist. Um, and one of them was to create a biobank. Um, what is a biobank? A biobank is basically a large collection of biological samples and all of the information attached to those samples. So are these from cancer patients or heart disease patients? Um, how old were the people they came from? What procedures did they undergo? Uh, what form is the tissue in? Um, what are our plans to look at that tissue um, and analyze all of that information? Uh, and so I have here at the bottom just that it's an abbreviation for a lot of stuff about us. Um, so the thing is, uh, not everyone agrees even on what a biobank is. Um, people assume that science is uh, a collection of facts of unassailable information. And actually, as we saw earlier this morning, um, I think the speaker said it beautifully. It is something where we step into uncertainty. And part of that uncertainty is even what we call things and the definitions of them. Uh, so some people don't even like to say biobank um, because it connotes uh, institutional involvement or bureaucracy or, boy, if I collect all of these samples and all of the information about them and I call it a biobank, then I'm going to have to send it to people like Misha and the IRB and get approval and send out consent forms. Um, so let's... Let's not even talk about that. Um, other people, I think, are more honest. Uh, for example, this quote here from the head of the world's largest university-based biorepository, or biobank. Biobanking is a science and a business. It's a science because, as I said, the idea is to aggregate all of this stuff, to collect all of this stuff, and with a large enough sample size to be able to make conclusions about it uh, that maybe lead to new drugs and treatments and cures if we, if we things really go our way. Um, but they're also valuable. Um, and increasingly, institutions want to monetize. Uh, that's another word that I love. Um, they want to take biological stuff and uh, figure out ways to, to make money from it. And that includes universities. So this is the protocol I was given um, for a large biobank at my university. And I have a selection from the consent form at the bottom. Uh, but again, like the earlier speaker, I made it deliberately small so that you couldn't read it. Um, and I've extracted the relevant parts, which are one, um, you, the participant in this biobank, will get nothing. We, on the other hand, the institution, will try to make money from it. Um, if you come back to get uh, another biopsy or another procedure, we're going to send somebody to get some more, as long as you're coming and you have your trousers down or your sleeve rolled up. And... Um, we're not going to share what we learn about you with you. If you get injured in our study, we happen to be a world-class medical center, so we can treat you, but we will send the bill to you or your insurer. On the bright side, you're not giving up any of your rights, so just sign here. <laughs> so what I said was, 
Um, how about we tell people who participate in this biobank what we're doing with their stuff? We just send them a Christmas card once a year saying, here's what's going on. Thank you for participating. And I suggested this to the principal investigator, and he and I went back and forth a few times. Um, and eventually, I was left with the sound of crickets, um, <laughs> which is what this slide is meant to represent. <laughs> um, I was going to put a picture of crickets, but I just thought it would be, I don't know, crickets are kind of nasty looking. Um, so that was the end of that, uh, and I lost that vote, I think, by a score of 18 to 1, or maybe one other idealistic soul. Uh, so that was one thing. And then the other thing did not happen in the context of the IRB, but in the context of my role as a researcher. Um, and this was, how do I try to walk the walk? Um, so I'm involved with something called the Task Force for Neonatal Genomics, where um, Allison Ashley Koch is in the audience here and is also part of this. Um, and what we do is we work with clinics from all over the Duke system, and these doctors identify mostly uh, babies who have things that look genetic um, but have not been diagnosed, and um, they send them to us, and we send the samples off to have uh, millions and millions of base pairs sequenced of their genomes, and we look for genetic causes for these undiagnosed conditions. And uh, at the end of the day, we hope to find one variant in the child's DNA that can explain his or her condition. But of course, we've done all of this other sequencing, so we have all of this other information. And traditionally, the impulse has been not to give any of that information back uh, about someone's response to drugs or what diseases they might be at risk for later in life. Um, but when we ask our participants, what, which of this information would you like back, they invariably say, all of it. And this is an email I received from one of our participants who said, you know, you've told me what's wrong with my son, but what about all of this other stuff? As a mother, I am ultimately responsible for my son's health and well-being. I would like a digital copy of my genome data, because we do both parents as well, and my son's. And I was left to shrug. Uh, and this is something we're continuing to figure out how to do this within the context of the rules. Meanwhile, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics has found that um, in certain cases where you have these so-called incidental findings that you weren't looking for, but which you've amassed as part of your large-scale DNA sequencing project, there are things that you should give back to people if it could save their lives, uh, whether they want it or not. And this has provoked a whole uh, firestorm in the field about um, people's right not to know, and who gets to make these decisions. And uh, my friend and colleague, Michelle Meyer, has summarized this very well, I think. She calls it the heterogeneity problem, and rightfully points out the regulatory system, that is, things like IRBs, implicitly respond to heterogeneity, that is, the fact that different people want different stuff, with risk aversion, with just saying, no, we're going to avert our eyes. We're not going to give people back any of that. And this is bad for research participants, and it's ultimately bad for science. Um, as it happens, when I had started to prepare this talk a couple of months ago, another firestorm erupted, 
A company called 23andMe, which is a so-called consumer genetics company where you spit in a tube and you mail it to the lab and you send them $99 and you get all sorts of information about yourself back. Um, some of which is more predictive and reliable than other stuff. Um, the FDA said to the company, you have to stop doing this. Uh, you can tell people about their ancestry. You can tell people if they have the genetic variant that makes their pee smell funny after they eat asparagus. <laughs> but you can't tell them about their health. You have to stop doing that because people are going to um, take it the wrong way. But they also said, you know, you can just give them the raw data and not tell them what it means, which I thought was fascinating. You know, it sort of leaves open this question, who gets to do the interpreting? Who gets to decide what this stuff means? Um, this article just came out a few days ago, um, and it's based on the work of a uh, friend and colleague, uh, Holly Tabor and, and Mike Bombshad at the University of Washington. And it essentially gives voice to um, blowhards like me who say, well, why don't we ask people what they want uh, with their own data? Um, they have given their own time and tax dollars. They've rolled up their sleeves. Um, so let's see what they want to do about it, and give them control. Um, this appeared in the New Yorker uh, a few months ago, a few weeks ago. And uh, the cartoon shows uh, a patient meeting with his doctor. And his doctor says, uh, before I give you a results, I just want to play some very sad music. <laughs> so this is where we are. Um, my hope is things will start to change and we can take these questions seriously. Um, is being anonymous good for me as a research participant? Is it good for science? Um, or is there something that we can learn by making ourselves available to the people we study, communicating with them, sharing things we learn about them with them? And this is the end of the Ralph Ellison quote. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. Thanks very much. <laughs>